Hi, I'm Joshua Friedman, and I lead the world's largest organization dedicated to growing the world's emotional intelligence. Today on the show, we're going to talk about what most people get wrong about emotional intelligence and why you can't get it from a training. You've got to embed it. How the most touchy feely thing that there is, joy, actually has a hard bottom line that you've got to tap into. And emotions can seem like a pain, but it's actually the ultimate resource for getting people to bring their value. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Let me tell you about Friend. Friend said that when she walked into the CEO's office, she felt like she was doing it in someone else's body. She was there, but somehow she was not there. Her mouth was dry, her palms were sweaty. When she had passed uh, her boss, they called him the chief. When she passed the boss that morning in the hallway, he'd asked her to come in and meet with her that afternoon. She told me that for the two and a half hours, it felt like her brain was leaking out of her ears between that initial meeting and going in. She felt like asking her in to come and speak in, uh, come and speak with her in the office. There was something that was she was afraid of, but she didn't know what it was. There was no reasonable answer. Only an ever cascading waterfall of nonsense that the meeting of what the meeting could be about self-awareness particularly emotional self-awareness can be tricky when you haven't either developed or reinforced your emotional intelligence but let's say that you have done the eq training let's say that you've read the emotional intelligence books and you have gone through the emotional intelligence assessment of yourself in the four quadrants and you feel like you're pretty sort of there but is there something missing well stay tuned because that's where we're going in the next two episodes so much of what emotional intelligence is actually about is missed in traditional emotional intelligence training. So we're going to sit down with the man Daniel Goldman, who was the author of the book, Emotional Intelligence, came to to ask about teaching EQ skills. And his name is Joshua Friedman. As always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please do us a favor, get over to wherever it is that you tune into podcasts from and do us a favor, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. We really appreciate it, and it does help. If you are a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And we're also honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. By the way, I know you're curious. My name is Dov Barron, and I'm the host. And I'm here to assist you tapping into one thing, whatever that one thing, that really true one thing is in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DoveBaron.com. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. If you have read any of my materials on uh, Medium, on The Curious Leader, you know that I've been writing and speaking a lot about the emotional impact of the pandemic. But did you know that up until 2019, levels of emotional intelligence were going up? However, since the pandemic, Globally speaking, emotional intelligence has steadily been dropping. My question to you is, could this in any way be connected to this thing we're experiencing called the Great Resignation? Let's face it, emotions can be difficult. They can be a pain. They come up when you don't want them to, and they can be difficult to understand. But if you do, what if you understood how incredibly valuable they could be? Well, that's where we're going on our next two episodes with our guest, Joshua Friedman. 
Joshua Friedman is the co-founder of Six Seconds, and for 25 years, he has partners with, partnered with leaders to build value with emotions in places like FedEx, the UN, and HSBC. Six Seconds now works in 200 com countries and territories to raise the world's emotional intelligence. Six Seconds is a global community of emotionally intelligent practitioners, researchers, and experts working towards 1 billion people practicing EQ. You can simply find out more about them at sixseconds.org. We'll tell you more about them later on. He is a master certified coach and the leader of the International EQ Coaching Certification. Joshua is an international bestseller of the, and author of the book, At the Heart of Leadership, which is one of five books he's written, including Wholehearted Parenting. He leads two ongoing research projects, the Workplace Vitality Report and the State of the Heart, which is the world's largest study of EQ. He's the co-author of Pop-Up Festival and, uh, in partnership with UNICEF, the World Children's Day, which is a free play-based curriculum, including SEL to 1.5 million children and adults. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome the author of At the Heart of Leadership, Mr. Joshua Friedman! Yay! <laughs> the excitement burns. It's the room is going wild. The two of us on stage together. <laughs> it's fantastic. What can I tell you? Hold on, I'll just swish my nipples. Oh, there you go. That's <laughs> so Joshua, what is, you know, like, we, as I said in the intro, emotional intelligence has become massive. It's now part of the lexicon of language. It's ubiquitous. People talk about it all over the place. But as I said in the intro, you know, you and I had a previous conversation. You talked to me about how Daniel Goldman came out with the book, and then he came to you and realized that you guys were teaching the strategies of this. What's the origin story of you when it comes to emotional intelligence? Well, when I first heard about this work, to be honest, I was like, oh, that's not for me. I was, uh, I grew up in a hyper-rational family. My, I have two statisticians for parents uh, <laughs> and a Navy officer as my stepdad. I was not, <laughs> this was way too touchy-feely for me. And I think that's part of why I've been good at this work is there's some people who are like, oh yeah, emotions, that's wonderful. I was afraid of emotions. I was uncomfortable with emotions. I didn't see the value in them. And then I've spent 25 years studying how they actually can create value for us as individual leaders and in our workplaces. So that's really interesting uh, that you came from that background. I think that that's actually incredible. As you said, it's incredibly valuable because there are a lot of people who are like, you know, it's a waste of time. What was the tipping point for you of going, you know, this is this, too touchy feely for me. Let's keep that at a distance to going, <laughs> well, this really has value for me, for us. So I was teaching in this school where emotional intelligence was part of the origin of the school. And uh, as you said, Dan Goldman had come and visited the school. He looked at the way we taught these skills and he said that, and he wrote in the book, this is the model. Uh, he said, you know, Aristotle would be proud <laughs> to see this kind of program. Um, I found the students that I was working with blew my mind. And they asked questions that I had never asked. Uh, we had this, this process is called self-science that we used in schools and we still use in schools. The science of yourself. Mm -hmm. And students could call anyone in. So I was teaching humanities and I was a little abrasive sometimes. And they would call me into self-science and say, well, when this happened, I felt this. And, you know, the impact on me was this. And wondering if we can talk about how, you know, this relationship. And I'm like, you're 13 years old. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? And what I discovered is that when I stopped trying to be a teacher and I started to be a human being in a room full of other human beings, everything changed. And that brought me back to why I had not been a very good manager, why I had not been a very good entrepreneur in my career prior to that. And um, led me to start to say, wow, I have something here to learn. 
And I think we all end up teaching what we most need to learn. And I needed to learn this. You just took the words right out of my mouth. We, we, we are here to learn, to teach what we need to learn. And that, like, how beautiful is that, that a 13 year old sort of goes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and thank God, because I mean, now as a CEO, these skills are taxed and challenged every day. And as a parent, I, I, my kids are now 21 and 23 and it's quite a lot of fun, but the few years ago, <laughs> it was like getting punched in the stomach. And so I really needed these skills. I need these skills, uh, in my, in my work all the time. And in these last couple of years, as you've said, you know, the world has been rocking us back and forth and I don't think we're going back to normal. I, I don't know that we should, uh, but I, I don't think even if we should, we're not gonna, no. we're going to need to become more adaptable and able to work in new ways. And I know you've had a lot of conversations on your show about, you know, we're in a different era of work and in a different era of work, what we've been doing before is unlikely to be great now. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, like you said, you've been 25 years in this, you know, so this is not new to you. And you're at the cutting edge of it in all the research and all the rest of it. But, you know, you and I had a conversation previously where I talked about, uh, and I know I'm going to offend some people here, so brace yourself, folks. Um, that <laughs> Do you ever, really? I know you were going to offend people? I, I, I know you're shocked. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I'm a little sus of, of, uh, of psychologists, mm. even though I'm one. Right? Mm. So, uh, because, again, we teach what we need to learn, and unfortunately, many of those teaching haven't bothered to learn. That's mm. you know my general bias. It's not an absolute at all. However... I'm wondering what it's like for you because you've been 25 years immersed in this and EQ is kind of thrown around now. When you look at the most traditional models of emotional intelligence, what's wrong with them? Because honest to God, I got to tell you that a lot of the time I'm meeting people who, who have all the qualifications of emotional intelligence and to me have the emotional intelligence of a wet sock. <laughs> you know, that's just me. Uh, Again, it's not just, it's not just you. <laughs> uh, I think David Caruso, who's one of the scientists uh, and practitioners who pioneered this work, um, together with his colleagues, Peter Salovey and Jack Mayer at Yale, uh, Peter Salovey at Yale, Jack Mayer at University of New Hampshire, um, David and I were talking about this one time and I said, you know, there are all these interesting models and I don't know, you know, maybe some of them are good. And, and he said, sure, but if we're going to talk about emotional intelligence at a very minimum, it ought to have both emotions and intelligence. You know, and if you look at the questionnaires that are published, well, first of all, most of them have the psychometric properties of a Cosmo quiz, but the questions that they ask are not about emotions and they're not about intelligence. No. So this is data. Yes. Emotions are data. Intelligence is about using, accurately acquiring data and using it to effectively solve problems. That's the dictionary definition of intelligence. Right. And so emotions are data. And unless we start treating emotions as data, saying, okay, we're actually going to talk about anger and fear and sorrow and regret and rage and disappointment and wonder and joy and commitment, all these rich, interesting feelings, if we're not actually going to talk about those, shut up. Mm. Like you're not doing emotional intelligence. And if you start saying, you know, oh, well, happiness is good, but anger is bad. You're not doing emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. You're doing pop psych. And I'm sorry. And there's something interesting about it, you know, and there's a lot of really interesting work out there about, you know, certain feelings, but all of our feelings are data. And we're going to need to learn how to decode this language that I didn't grow up with. And I think hardly any of us did. Well, I, I mean, that, that brings up a very interesting piece because I think we all grow up with emotions, mm. um, but we also grow up with the, the 
conditioning around what emotion is okay and what okay, emotion is not okay. Yeah. Uh, if you may have grown up in a family where the only acceptable feeling was happiness, and so you put on your plastic smile, you may have grown up in a family where the only acceptable feeling was anger, you know, whatever it is. Uh, uh, whereas anything else is, I don't know, somehow not not allowed. So the the challenge with emotional intelligence you know again as data is well data is seen as non-subjective and emotions mm. are seen as entirely subjective so yeah. walk us through that that it's kind of a fog for a lot of people it's also countercultural, right right we the norm in most of the world and certainly in the western world is that you know emotions are sort of random and we we, we should probably ignore them but if we're not, at, you know, there are a couple of emotions we're allowed. And anger, interestingly, is the emotion that most, in most Western cultures, men are socialized that anger is a sort of acceptable emotion. And women in general are socialized that sorrow is a, a sort of acceptable emotion. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of men who are scared and they'll act angry. They're sad and they'll act angry. And in uh, our research in workplaces, by far the most expressed feeling in the workplace is frustration, which is mm -hmm. a form of anger. Yep. And I think that is connected to the male domination of the workplace. But to your question, this notion that emotions are, are data, we can start to look at it from a neurobiological perspective. Mm -hmm. And we can start to understand that there's actual chemicals in our brains and bodies we can now watch the brain processing this data essentially in real time. We can see how different brain areas activate. We can see how these emotion chemicals go flowing through our brains and bodies. And we're, we're actually called six seconds because of the neurobiology of emotion. Uh, Candace Pert was one of our advisory board members uh, before she I know Candace. Away. I knew Candace before she died. Yeah, amazing. I spent a week with her in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, her and awesome. John, her husband, and my wife and I. Yeah. I did fantastic. not know that. That's very cool, man. So Candace and I were chatting and she she's a, was a trip, you know. And Oh yeah. Um <laughs> and she's like, you know, what like what people are getting so much wrong about emotions. Uh and she said essentially emotions are like a second nervous system. Mm -hmm. We have these, these, these nerves that carry information and energy, and we have these chemicals that carry information and energy. Now, she was the chief of brain science at the National Institutes of Health. So we're talking about a pretty serious <laughs> research scientist. Mm -hmm. And she discovered that there's a part of our brain, which is supposedly the seat of rationality, which had emotion detectors. And this was this huge breakthrough that led her to write the book, Molecules of Emotion. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she said to me, like, these, these are, this is the glue that holds the organism together. And it's a communication system inside us and between us. But these chemicals only last for about six seconds in our brains and bodies, four to seven. Mm -hmm. Now they can act much more quickly and the effects can last longer, but the that's actual right. chemical is broken down and absorbed in about six seconds. And that's why we named the organization six seconds. That's very cool. Yeah. That's very, that's very, I never, never even put that together. <laughs> like I saw the name and I never put it together. I mean, I, I know Candice's work and I know that, but I never, <laughs> never put those three things together. It was like, well, okay, that's very cool. So, The challenge with it is, and, and this is someone I want to talk to you about from if you're conditioned. So for instance, when I met my wife and I said, because I have done a lot of work on myself, even when I met her, um, I said, here's what you need to know. It, my emotional source code is this. And I explained sort of where I come from. And I said, so when I'm pissed off, you need to know something. She goes, what? I said, I'm hurt. Mm. I'm not angry. It will look like anger. I may demonstrate anger, but I'm actually hurt. And if you, and I said, it's not your job to, to fix that. That's my job. But if you can remember that, 
You can maybe even remind me if you want, but if you don't want to, it's fine. It's not your responsibility. Mm. But it's her. And again, it's that same thing around the social conditioning of anger is okay. So a woman who is angry might end up looking like she's sad because mm -hmm. the social conditioning of sadness. So now we get to this, this data point that you're talking about, which is, okay, so how are you feeling, Charlie? I'm feeling mm. pissed off and angry. Mm. The data point for him is anger. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't have the emotional depth, he doesn't know that he's sad or that he's disappointed or that he's frustrated or that he's any number of other things. So when we talk about emotional intelligence, I always feel like, and this is my bias, Joshua, so I really want your input on it. I it always feels like, Jesus, guys, stop skimming the surface. Mm -hmm. I feel like everybody's talking about emotional intelligence as this surface thing, and it doesn't have the depth that it requires. And it's been, it's now become this, uh, what would be the term? It's become this uh, pop psychology version of actually doing therapeutic work. Mm -hmm. Help me out. Help me understand that because I'm trying to have people understand emotional intelligence. Right. But actually understand that doing your EQ test and reading your EQ book is not going to be enough. You actually have to have self-knowledge. And by that, I don't mean I'm a dick. Oh, I have self-knowledge. No, <laughs> as in, why am I a dick? Which is different. And how do I stop being how one? How do I stop being one? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember <laughs> when we were starting to work with the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, which is a really interesting couple of organizations. And I remember a, a, a senior officer said, I really like this work. I think this could be really helpful for us. But could we just call it something else? Because people are really uncomfortable with the word emotions. I'm like, well, sir, if we can't even use the word emotions, I think it's going to be hard for us to get the value of these skills. Right. So, yeah, okay, good point. So I do recognize, again, this is countercultural, and I do recognize that going in and, and you know, I work with tough organizations. Uh, you know, I work with the UN, I've, as I said, all branches of the US military, I've worked with other military organizations, very big, very transactional, very fast companies. And the, the hard part is getting to that point of saying, okay, there's value here. And in order for us to get that value, we're going to actually have to engage in a different way. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to talk about emotions, fine, don't. If you don't want to feel what you're feeling, don't. If you don't want to get past that surface layer, don't. But you're not going to get the value. So if you want the value that I'm offering, here's a plate of cookies. You want the cookies, you're going to have to come in the office and we're going to have to have a conversation. Like we're going to actually have to get into this emotional domain. And we use a metaphor of an iceberg. We think about what's visible on the surface is one eleventh of the iceberg, yeah. right? And there's all this other stuff. So I actually don't like the question, how are you feeling? Because that's a reductivist question. Mm -hmm. Like today, oh my goodness, I've got like 17 things up for me today. And, you know, and talking to you and... And thinking about this, I woke up early this morning. I'm kind of on Eastern time right now. And I woke up early this morning thinking about our, our conversation today and all the stuff going on today and, and my grandma in the hospital and, 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 and how are you feeling? I don't freaking know. Mm -hmm. I've studied this for 25 years. I'm feeling like seven things. And so a much more useful question to be asking ourselves and each other, what are some of your feelings? Mm. Oh, okay. I can answer that question. And I'm going to save everybody 500 bucks and give you the, the, you don't, you don't have to pay for a coaching session with me. Here's the question I'm going to ask you. If, if I'm coaching you, I'm going to say, you're going to tell me what's going on. You're going to tell me, you're going to answer this question of what are some of your feelings. And then I'm going to say to you, but this is where we should take a commercial break, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm going to say to you, what else are you feeling? Yes. Right? Because yeah. there's some, there's more. There's a great 
a body of research, if you Google the emergent theory of emotions, and in this body of research, the notion is that we have all these emotion chemicals we're producing all the time. There's a part of our brain that's a little emotion factory. We produce them in our guts, around our heart, spine, even in our hands and toes. And these chemicals are coursing around in our brains and bodies, and they're waiting for us to need them. So the emergent theory of emotion basically says we have every emotion we need right now. Mm -hmm. It's all there. Right. And some of it's kind of quiet. And some of it's like really out there. So when this guy says, and it usually is a guy who says, oh, I'm frustrated. Okay, great. That's the loud voice. Yes. What else are you feeling? Yeah. What's the whisper? What's the whisper? What's the whisper that you're not quite listening to or it's not okay to listen to? Yeah, that's really good. And by the way, from a leadership perspective, look around the room. What's the whisper in the room? Because people are giving you for free tons of data. Mm -hmm. Just look around the room. And ask yourself that question. Don't you think people are deaf? Yes. <laughs> and, and I think we've in part been deafened by, you know, listening to those really loud voices only. Yeah. And being conditioned about which voices are okay to listen to. Yes. And we had a great conversation about this that really stuck with me about how we get in this like so quickly into judgment about what we're feeling. Yeah. And even, and maybe because this is why I do this work. I remember when my dad died and, you know, I've studied emotions. I've studied grief. I know anger is part of grief. My dad dies and I'm sitting there and I'm feeling angry at him. And I still say to myself, oh, you shouldn't be angry. Mm. And I stop shooting on yourself. I, yeah. But it's there. It's part of our culture. Yeah, it is. Joshua, this is a fascinating conversation, my friend. Delicious. Thank you so much. We are already close to the end of part one of the show. So I want to make sure that people know how to find out about you, about Six Seconds, about your book, of course, and all the wonderful resources that you have. Uh, would you mind please sharing with everybody where they can find out more about you and those resources? SixSeconds.org, a huge website, tons and tons of articles. We have a whole library of business cases. We have uh, interactive online tools that are free. And then we also have information about how you can utilize these tools in your business. If you're uh, an entrepreneur, you're wanting to do this in your own business. We have consultants all over the world who have deep expertise. We also have a whole set of assessment tools and development tools, certification programs, so you can embed this in your organization. And I'd love to talk more about how you actually create organizational value with this stuff, because that is where the real magic happens in companies. Well, let's talk about that in part two, about taking this beyond the personal, but into the corporate, into the leadership role as we move forward. So stay tuned because we're going to be back for more of our delicious conversation with Joshua in part two. So stay curious, my friends, stay curious about the value of your emotions. See you soon. <laughs>